first question is about what it means to be a philosopher. Sure, sure. So, philosophically speaking, being a professional philosopher means asking the, the hard questions that others either don't ask or perhaps don't even know how to ask. It, it means placing an emphasis on questions over answers, which really sets philosophy apart from all the other sciences. Questions over answers. What good is an answer if the question is ill-formed? And being a professional philosopher means a great deal of thinking about critical thinking. Practically speaking, though, it's about an endless succession of job applications, funding applications, journal submissions, and, yes, periods of unemployment. The humanities are not looked on very kindly these days. They are, amusingly, for a philosopher, not considered sufficiently practical. Uh, I wonder if I might say just a little about myself for your students, if that sounds good. Sure, I sure. Was, I was good. I was born in and I grew up around Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in the United States. Harrisburg was and remains famous or infamous for being the nearest city to the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant, which you probably have heard of, yes. Um, whose one reactor suffered catastrophic failure when I was 15 years old. I've lived in the UK and Ghana and I've been in Sweden for the last 12 years. Wow. wow. And what brought you to, to philosophy? What was the main idea? Why you, ch you have chosen this, uh, this particular field? Because I'm interested in how our thoughts are structured and how we in our minds create our understanding, structure our understanding of the world around us, how we then translate that understanding into language and from language back into thought. What do philosophers mean by the theory of mind? Is it sure, different sure. from what psychologists study, what um, neuroscientists study, what, 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 what is it? Neuroscientists usually aren't interested in theory of mind. Philosophers and psychologists are. Now, I'm assuming that you mean theory of mind and not philosophy of mind here, because there is a difference. So I'll address theory of mind, and then I'll talk a bit about philosophy of mind, if that sounds good. Theory of mind has a fairly precise and important meaning within philosophy. It's meant to describe the way people understand other people as having minds like their own. The way they anticipate other people's responses by knowing their own likely responses. My impression is that the term is used much the same way in psychology. What I think most psychologists don't worry about, and some, or perhaps many, philosophers do, including myself, is the way the concept theory of mind risks over-intellectualizing the process of thinking. For the most part, people don't theorize about the way other people's minds work in any remotely scientific type way. They just intuitively feel like they know sometimes correctly, sometimes not. Then there's philosophy of mind, which is my primary domain. It's usually considered as belonging to analytic rather than continental philosophy, for those who are familiar with that distinction in the English-speaking world, or as belonging to theoretical rather than practical philosophy, for those familiar with that distinction, very common in continental Europe. But I really see philosophy of mind as crossing all these divides, at least for me and the way I approach it. The, the big difference between philosophy of mind and psychology, to make that distinction, is that psychology tends to focus on looking for answers, whereas philosophy of mind says, hold on, slow down, what are you really asking? In many Russian uh, textbooks, philosophy textbooks, 
uh, one of the central problems, one of the central issues is the issue of consciousness. Uh, sure. And is, is it the same in uh, analytical philosophy? Is it one of the central problems of a philosophy of mind? What is consciousness? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. And I'd, I'd be happy to go on and, and talk about what I think consciousness is. So I think the question, what is consciousness? Uh, it's a question we can only ever hope to give up a partial and a, a provisional answer to. The problem is that as conscious entities, which I assume we all are, we cannot attempt to answer the question, what is consciousness, without addressing our own consciousness. A truly objective answer to the question would require stepping outside of ourselves, setting aside our consciousness, to look back in on it from the outside, and that, of course, we cannot do. For us, as conscious and self-conscious entities, subjective experience and objective reality just are inextricably intertwined. That is always the case, I think. But the difficulty becomes acute when we turn our attention from the world around us to ourselves and to our consciousness. Nevertheless, some very useful things can be said about consciousness, particularly if one takes a functional perspective. For me, as a philosopher of mind, consciousness and conceptual agency are two sides of one single coin. Consciousness, conceptual agency. Conceptual agency is simply our ability to think in systematically and productively structured fashion. By systematic, I mean that we can take the same set of concepts and use them in more or less the same fashion across unboundedly many contexts. By productive, I mean that we can take a finite number of concepts and combine them and recombine them into unboundedly many complex concepts. So that's conceptual agency. The hallmark of both consciousness and conceptual agency then is the ability of certain agents to respond flexibly to events in their environment. So not in any pre-programmed manner as we think of with computer programs. Um, to respond flexibly to events in their environment based on a weighted consideration of past experience and anticipation of likely outcomes. They can stop, think, possibly reflect, and they can change their mind. Their behavior is not fully determined either by their physical nature or by prior events. Wow, wow. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, and, uh, well, one of the central issues, one of the core issues, as far as I can understand and how I explain it to my students is the sure. uh, relation of uh, mind and body. Uh, so sure. the so-called mind-body problem. Uh, are there different approaches in modern in contemporary philosophy uh, related to these issues? Sure, sure there are. Um, there aren't a great many different approaches that, that basically break down into, I would say, three different approaches, all of which have their problems. Uh, first of all, you have the reductionists. These people believe that, at least in principle, mind reduces to brain and body, mental stuff reduces to physical stuff. There appears to be a mind-body problem, they say, because we do not know, at least yet, how to do the reduction. Intuitions differ among reductionists about the likelihood of getting there. Then you have the eliminativists, like Paul and Patricia Churchland, who bite the bullet and in insist that the mind does not exist. We have no mental lives, there is no consciousness. I personally find such a position logically incoherent. Then you have the anti-reductionists, who believe that it's all just physical stuff, but that mind cannot be reduced to physical matter, even in principle, because it lies outside of our cognitive capacities, which they say are knowably bounded. So the anti-reductionists tend to say that there will always be 
a mind-body problem. I actually don't think that there is a mind-body problem, or at least I don't think there needs to be one. That's because I think that what we call mental and what we call physical are not two ontologically distinct substances, as Cartesian dualism would have it, but two competing, complementary, yet ultimately irreconcilable perspectives on one and the same world, perspectives that we shift continuously and mostly unconsciously between. The mistake is to think that there is one correct answer. Either mind reduces to brain or brain reduces to mind. No, it doesn't work that way. Well, personally, I uh, think I am uh, kind of reductionist. Uh, sure, that's the most popular may maybe position. I can call myself physicalist uh, because, well, I, I think these things are equal. And maybe, maybe I'm really close to your point of view because I don't think that we should separate. Uh, I don't agree with Cartesian mo model. Uh, so here it's really nice to to uh, understand that probably we are in the same uh, on the same position here. My point is that the the only alternative to Cartesian dualism for many researchers and for many philosophers in particular is that of reductive physicalism, and it's not the only alternative. So there are, there are actually a number of different alternatives. The one that's the most interesting to me is the one that I was sketching out, where we don't really have a good understanding of what we mean by mental or what we mean by physical. And we have these two perspectives on the world we keep shifting between. One of them, we push the observer into the background and pretend that the observer is not there. We pretend to take a strictly objective perspective. In the other perspective, we bring the observer into the foreground. And then we think first and foremost about the subjectivity of the experience, and we ignore the objective side. But like I keep trying to come back to, I think subjective experience and objective reality are inseparably intertwined. We, we cannot pull them apart. I agree here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope my students, well, I, I, I will try to explain, uh, uh, but, but I hope they will understand this idea. Uh, and mo I'm moving to the next question. And sure, uh, sure. it's about uh, most important in your, in your um, from your point of view, most important uh, philosophers, contemporary philosophers in the uh, theory of mind, in the field of uh, philosophy of mind. It, let it be right. philosophy of mind, okay? Philosophy of yeah. mind, yes. Yes, that's probably, <laughs> More probably what... Exactly. Theory of mind, like I said, is this idea that we anticipate other people's thoughts and actions by theorizing about what's going on in their minds. So that's a very precise idea, and many philosophers of mind don't actually agree with that idea. Okay, so prominent philosophers, sure. There, there are so many names that I could choose from. In just my little corner of interest, which is conceptual agency, the big names are Peter Jerdenforsch at the University of Lund in Sweden, Jesse Prince at City University of New York in the States, the late Jerry Fodor at Princeton University, he died in, I think, 2016, 2017, thereabouts, Ruth Milliken, University of Connecticut, and Eleanor Roche at University of California, Berkeley. Fodor, Jerry Fodor, I find fascinating because he is so consistently, even reliably wrong, in my opinion, of course, and yet wrong in such interesting ways. Yerdenforsch, uh, his great insight is to apply the language of geometry to the structure of thought, where thoughts exist as alternate, alternately points or as convexly shaped regions of conceptual space. This is his so-called conceptual spaces theory. 
Dave Chalmers has gifted us with philosophical zombies, people just like us, only there's no one at home. They pretend to be conscious, they pretend to be conscious entities, yet there is no consciousness. At the intersection between philosophy of mind, cognitive science, and machine ethics, you need to talk about such people as Joanne Bryson at University of Bath, Peter Paul Verbeek at the University of Twente in the Netherlands, or Christian Munte at the University of Gothenburg here in Sweden. Colin Allen, University of Pittsburgh in the States, was one of the key people behind the so-called moral Turing test, and has also written importantly about the minds of non-human animals, along with Albert Nguyen from Ruhr University in uh, Bochum in Germany. Within more traditional moral philosophy, there are such giants as Elizabeth Anscombe, who died in 2001, or Philippe Foot, who died in 2010. Philippe Foot is famous for having given us the trolley problem, if you're familiar with that. Notably lacking from this list are any philosophers from the Chinese or Russian-speaking worlds. R Chinese philosophy is treated as its own subdivision of philosophy in the West, while Russian philosophy, with the exception of a few standouts like Lev Vygotsky, who was of course actually a psychologist, largely does not make an impact, which I think is terribly unfortunate. Well, ho hopefully uh, our young philosophers uh, from uh, Moscow yeah. State University, uh, well, they, they have a very, um, well, a relatively new center for um, uh, consciousness studies, uh, as, far, as far as I can translate it into English. Uh, well, they, they are working uh, hard. And Sounds I, exciting. I hope soon there will be more uh, publications uh, from um, from Moscow. Well, and more and more cross fertilization because it's it's frustrating uh, coming from the English speaking world to realize that there's so much quality philosophy being done out there that's not crossing the the language boundaries. Well, I. I I think some works are published, but but they, oh, of course, they, some are. They, some they, are, they but... are not 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 really uh, in the in the center of attention. Yeah, they are not 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 uh, not at all. Not cited, not quoted uh, enough. May, may, maybe it it takes some time, you know, because in Russian th philosophy, uh, the ideas from. Um, uh, from analytic philosophy are relatively new because uh, during the Soviet period of time uh, most uh, most authors were not translated into Russian most right. uh, most books were not available so so there was long period of non communication with where uh, w w when uh, Western philosophy was practically blocked so nobody could study it and uh, right now it's only I think it's first generation of free philosophers who really um, develop their uh, their theories uh, without that uh, limitation you know so, so hopefully soon we will hear something new let's move to the next question and it's sure. uh, closer to your uh, to your works to your articles uh, I, I just checked a couple of your recent articles and wow uh, uh, I I think they are really they are really interesting in in terms of concepts that, okay. that are uh, developed and uh, that are presented in, in, in them uh, but of course Neither for me nor for my students, uh, these concepts are uh, not simple. Well, it's it's really interesting how you explain them. Uh, so, first question was about uh, 2017 article, 2017 article, uh, and the un unbinding problem. So, could you explain what is it? Sure. So. I have to start with the so-called binding problem, which is a question of how sensory inputs, as they are generally framed, combine with brain processes to produce conscious experience of objects, agents, events, and so on. How does consciousness get assembled in the brain? That's a valid question, albeit one that I don't think we can ever hope 
to answer fully. But I think it's gotten far too much of the attention. What I call the unbinding problem is the flip side of the coin. Human beings are conscious in some substantive sense from the first weeks of life. But infants don't have much in the way of concepts. Probably not much more than me, not me. So the unbinding problem is the way that consciousness, which seems to be phenomenally unified from the beginning, but with minimal conceptual structure, gets progressively divided and subdivided into all the fine-grained conceptual distinctions we effortlessly make as adults. That is, we start out life with bare conscious awareness, but we end up with something seemingly very different. How do we get there? So basically, it's about complexity of our consciousness. It's about moving from a phenomenally unified consciousness with no conceptual distinctions to a consciousness that is able to make increasingly fine-grained distinctions. Mm -hmm. I, I, hope, I hope I understand. Uh, well, Dividing up the world yes. in smaller and smaller and more precise ways. Yeah, that, that, that's really a, quite an interesting and very, very opening idea. I, I believe, well, I, I, should, I should study it more. I should read it more carefully. And one more article that I, I, I just looked through. I understand that it's also very complex for me and I have to read it line by line. Uh, but, uh, well, your uh, 2019 article on the essentially dynamic nature of concepts, uh, constant uh, if incremental motion in conceptual spaces. And you are writing about unified conceptual space theory. Right. Can you give a brief explanation of this, uh, of this idea? Sure. I've been writing about this ever since my doctoral thesis. I put the theory forth the first time in my doctoral thesis, which was passed in 2011, and have been developing it ever since. Earlier in our conversation, I mentioned Yerdenforsch's conceptual spaces theory, which attempts to explain what he calls the geometric, geometric structure of conceptually structured thought. Something that Yerdenforsch wanted to do with that theory and has not yet been able to do to his satisfaction is to explain how all our different conceptual spaces of colors, of sounds, of places and activities abstract ideas like democracy or ennui come together in a single space of spaces, a single fundamental concept, if you will, that sits at the root of all our other concepts. If this sounds a bit like the binding problem and the unbinding problem, it is real. Conceptual spaces theory posits, and the unified conceptual space theory attempts to explain how we start with an initially minimally structured conceptual space in our infancy and divide it into progressively finer categories. At the same time, we sometimes have to tear out whole parts of the structure and start over again. When the scientific community does that or when society does that on a large scale, it's what Thomas Kuhn calls a paradigm shift. When an individual does it, it's a midlife crisis or the like. But we, all of us, tear down in greater and smaller ways all the time throughout our lives, I think. So this notion of concepts being essentially dynamic, that's actually very controversial. Many, I would say even most philosophers of mind would reject it. They would say that concepts are stable, even static. They are fixed ways of referencing points in the world. And the argument I make in my paper is that, no, we're constantly reshaping our concepts of the world. We're constantly reshaping the ways in which we interact with and conceptualize the world. Um, may I ask uh, one question about... Um, Please. Well, j j just to... Um, make it more clear. Uh, if we compare your uh, approach to uh, concepts uh, with Plato's theory of ideas, Ada's uh, 
I'm not sure about pronunciation in Russian. This is a, a Greek word Aedes. Uh, so uh, his idea was that it's something that is really stable and un never changing. And you are uh, your idea is opposite. Not the opposite. It's more nuanced than that. So someone like Lawrence Barcelou talks as if concepts are just constantly changing, never in one place. And to some extent, I think that's right. I think that's a, a correct perspective. Uh, but it also misses something. So to me, there's a constant tension in con uh, conceptual agency between stability and dynamics. So concepts have to be stable enough for us to be able to use them across unboundedly many different contexts. But at the same time, they have to adapt to fit each new context. And every context that we encounter in life is at least a little bit different from every context that we've encountered before. So it's a tension between stability and dynamics. Wow. The more that we just get on with using concepts, then the more dynamic they are, constantly in motion. The more we stop to think about our concepts, the more stable they are. And as we think about thinking about our concepts, then they become even more stable and appear static. Great. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, and my last question. Uh, my last question is spe especially for my students because, well, uh, as I've already said, they are in computer science. Uh, and what would you uh, recommend and what would you say are the most important aspects of this theory? What should they pay attention to? What? Sure, sure. First and foremost, if there's only one paper in English language philosophy that they ever read, it should be Alan Turing's 1950 paper, Computing, Machinery, and Intelligence, where Turing sets forth what he calls his imitation game and has since come to be known as the Turing test. A seemingly simple exercise by which a computer, communicating solely via a keyboard, would attempt to fool a person into thinking it was another human being. Despite the obvious and often sensationalistic claims to the contrary, no computer, no software program has yet passed the Turing test. None has really even come close to doing so. And I don't think one's going to pass it anytime soon, despite Turing's optimistic prediction that it would happen he thought before the year 2000, so within 50 years of publishing the article. The basic insight of his paper, though, that human intelligence can be described in mathematical terms is sheer genius and years ahead of its time. Minds and machines have their important differences, to be sure, at least to this point. Uh, minds and artifactual machines, I should say. But we're more alike in some ways than we might comfortable thinking. Otherwise, your students really should dig into and chew over in their minds ideas and ethics of technology. First, science and technology are, I would say, ethically neutral. But the consequences of their applications very often, maybe most often, are not ethically neutral. Second, computer systems and robots are increasingly operating in ways that appear autonomous, even if they're not really people are already offloading moral responsibility onto the artifacts, arguably long before they're ready. That creates a responsibility vacuum where in practice nobody knows who's responsible. Consider an autonomous battlefield robot that engages in friendly fire. Who's to blame? The general issuing the order that the robot misinterprets? The company that manufactured it? one may be tempted to blame the robot and indeed many people will and indeed many people have but there are problems with that because I don't think any artifact has come anywhere near achieving the status of being a moral agent um, and then yeah we could talk we could talk some more if, if we had time about uh, uh, current issues in philosophy of mind or unsolved problems there but 
it's been really great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much.